In this video, we will have a look at the method of gradient descent, also known as the steepest descent. We will start by calculating the gradient on a simple example. Then we will have a look at an example where we calculate the gradient in two dimensions. And finally see how the method can be used to estimate parameters in a nonlinear regression model based on the least square method. Let's begin by studying the following function. We see that the slope, or the derivative, of this function is positive when x is greater than negative 1. Whereas the function has a negative slope when x is less than negative 1. When x is exactly equal to negative 1, the slope is equal to 0. Note that the term gradient can also be used when we refer to the derivative or the slope. In contrast to the derivative, the term gradient is usually used when we study the slope in several dimensions. Let's calculate the derivative of this function by using the power rule that we have covered in the previous video. This is the derivative of the function. For example, if we like to calculate the derivative of this function when x is equal to 1, we set x to 1 and do the math. We see that the derivative is equal to 8, which means that the corresponding tangent line has a slope of 8. Now, suppose that we like to know what the value of x is when the slope is equal to 0. If you set the left hand side to 0 and solve for x, we see that the derivative is equal to 0 when x is equal to negative 1. The x value that results in a slope of 0 is the same value as where this function has its minimum value. If you set x to negative 1 in this equation, and do the math, we see that y is equal to 3 when x is equal to negative 1. This means that no other value of x can result in a y value that is smaller than 3. The function therefore has its minimum value when x is equal to negative 1, which corresponds to the x value where the gradient is equal to 0. We'll now see how the gradient descent method can be used to find the minimum value of this function. The method works as an iterative procedure by calculating a new x value based on the current x value minus the gradient or the derivative of the function at the current x value multiplied by some parameter called the learning rate that is set by the user. The method starts with some initial value of x that is guessed by the user. Suppose that we initially guess x to 2 and that we in this example use a learning rate of 0.1. We now need to calculate the derivative of the function when x is equal to 2. We therefore set x to 2 in this equation and do the math. We see that the derivative of the function when x is equal to 2 is 12. We should therefore reduce the current x value by 1.2, which means that the new x value should be equal to 0.8. The derivative of the function at 0 0.8 is 7.2. To calculate the next x value, we plug in the current x value and the derivative at the current point, and do the math. The new x value is therefore 0 0.08. Then we do the same calculations again, and note that the new x value is now equal to approximately negative 0.35. We continue like this. If we continue to iterate many times, the x value will be approximately equal to negative 1. Note that the step size is getting smaller and smaller once we approach the minimum value of the function because the derivative is approaching 0. Now, suppose that we instead would have guessed the initial value of x to negative 4. Then we will do the same calculations again, but with the difference that the derivative is now negative, which will now instead increase the value of x from negative 4 to negative 2.8. One problem with the gradient descent method is that it is very sensitive to the value of the learning rate. 
suppose that we would set the learning rate to 0 0.5. That would result in that the new x value is equal to negative 4. If you update again, the x value would go back to the previous x value. Then we would have a ping pong effect like this that will go on forever. A larger learning rate would even result in that the x value would move away from the minimum value. To make sure that the method converges to the minimum value, we must select a small learning rate. However, a too small learning rate might be too computationally expensive, which means that we need to wait forever before the method converge. We will now see how we can implement the gradient descent method. I will here use the software R to do this. Here is one example of how you can implement this simple example in R. We first define the initial value of x. Then we create the function which computes the derivative at a certain point. We here use a learning rate of 0 0.1. In this example, we set the maximum number of iterations to 1000, which means that if the method has not converged within 1000 steps, we give up searching for the minimum value. This object is our counter, which will count the number of iterations. We will continue to iterate as long as the counter is less than the maximum number of iterations, and as long as the absolute value of the derivative is greater than 0 0.000001. If the absolute value of the derivative would be less than 0 0.000001, that means that we are super close to the minimum value of the function, because that is the place where the derivative is equal to zero. Note that there are other types of stopping criteria, such as the absolute value of the step size. If the step size is super small, which occurs when the derivative is super small, the iterations will stop. For each iteration, we calculate the derivative of the function at the current value of x, which will be used to update the next value of x. Finally, we update the counter by 1 and update the old x value by the new x value before we start over. This piece of code will be iterated over and over as long as these conditions are true. Once the iterations have stopped, we print the current value of x, the number of iterations and the derivative at this point. If the number of iterations is equal to 1000 in this example, we know that the method has not been successful. If we run this code, we see that after 32 iterations, the iteration stopped because the derivative was smaller than 0 0.00001, which means that the method has converged. We see that the method results in a value that is approximately equal to negative 1, which is the point where the function has its minimum value. The method can also be used to search for the minimum value in several dimensions. Suppose that we have the following function. We can then calculate the partial derivatives like this that we have discussed in the previous video. When we differentiate with respect to x, we treat y as a constant, which results in x plus 2. And when we differentiate with respect to y, we treat x as a constant, which results in 2y plus 1. We then update the x value based on the partial derivative of the function with respect to x and update the y value based on the partial derivative of the function with respect to y. If we apply this method on this function, we would see that the function has its minimum value when x is equal to negative 2 and y is equal to negative 0 0.5. We'll now see how the gradient descent method can be applied to find the parameters that result in the least sum of squares. In a previous video, we discussed the method of ordinary least squares with a simple example. And in another video, we compare the ordinary least squares with the maximum likelihood method. The gradient descent method can be used in both ordinary least squares and the maximum likelihood method. We will here see how gradient descent can be applied in nonlinear regression. We will fit the same function to the same data as an example in the video about nonlinear regression. Remember that the distance between a curve 
and an observation is called a residual or an error. The residuals are calculated by taking the absurd values minus the fitted values which are the corresponding values of the curve. Suppose that the absurd y value of this observation is equal to 10 and that the value of the curve at the same x coordinate as the observation is equal to 8. Then the residual is equal to 2. Let's place the first residual here. Then we calculate the second residual in the same way. Note that this residual is negative because the data point is below the curve. Then we calculate the third residual and so forth. We then square the residuals. So that we get the squared residuals. Then we sum the squared residuals so that we get the sum of the squared residuals or the sum of the squared errors, S is E. The sum of the squared errors is calculated by the following equation where we sum the squared residuals which are the differences between absurd values and the fitted values according to the curve. If we go back to the example we discussed in the video about nonlinear regression we know that the following parameter values result in the lowest possible sum of squared errors. When we fit the following function to this data, by using these parameter values, the sum of the squared residuals is equal to about 36. Suppose that we would reduce the value of k from 0 0.029 to 0 0.02. Then we see that the curve does no longer fit well with the data because most data points are below the curve. The sum of the squared errors has now increased from 36 to 1531, simply because the data points are now much further away from the curve. Suppose that we instead would increase the value of k to 0 0.04. Then we see that most data points are now above the curve. The sum of the squared errors is equal to about 777. Let's say that we would like to plot how the sum of the squared errors changes as a function of k. We know that when k is equal to 0 0.02, the sum of the squared errors is equal to 1531. When k is equal to 0 0.029, the sum of the squared errors is equal to 36. And when k is equal to 0 0.04, the sum of the squared errors is equal to 777. If we generate a range of different values of k and calculate the sum of the squared errors for each value of k, then we could generate the following curve. We see that the value of k that results in the lowest possible sum of squared errors is 0 0.029. We'll now see how the gradient descent method can find this value. This is the nonlinear function that we try to fit to the data. If we replace y hat by the nonlinear function in this equation where we calculate the sum of the squared errors, we will have the following equation. If you use the chain rule, we can calculate the derivative of this equation with respect to k. Differentiating the SSE function with respect to k by using the chain rule will result in the following function. Suppose that we initially start with the value of k that is equal to 0 0.06. Then we calculate the derivative of the SSE function when k is equal to 0 0.06, which corresponds to the slope of the curve here. To calculate the derivative, we need to plug in the y data for this example and the corresponding time points. Since the gradient is very steep in this example, the learning rate has to be quite small. If we update the value of k, we will see that the method will iterate until the value of k is equal to about 0 0.029, which results in the lowest possible sum of squared errors. We can expand this to also estimate the second parameter, y0. However, due to problems in finding an appropriate learning rate, the gradient descent method is not the best choice in nonlinear regression. Instead, other methods, such as the Gauss-Newton method, 
are preferred to solve nonlinear least squares problems. We'll cover this method in another video. Note that it might sometimes be hard or even impossible to find the analytic derivative of a function. In such a case, it is usually possible to differentiate numerically to calculate the gradient at a certain point that we have discussed in the previous video. In our example, this would correspond to that we calculate the sum of the squared errors at the current value of k plus a very small increase in k. Minus the same thing, but where we make a small decrease in k. The value of h should be set to a very small number, for example 0 0.00001. Finally, we'll discuss some problems by using the gradient descent method. This is how the sum of the squared errors is changing over a wider range of the parameter k. We see that when k is greater than 0 0.4, the gradient of this function is close to 0. An initial guess in this region might therefore result in that the method may need to continue to iterate millions of times before it can reach the global minimum. In comparison, the gradient is relatively steep here which means that the too large value of the learning rate will result in that the value of k is increased to this part of the curve, where the curve is relatively flat. This is one reason why the gradient descent method does not perform well in nonlinear regression. For more complicated nonlinear functions, there might also exist several minima, which complicates things even further. In this example, we have three minima. The point at which the function has the minimum sum of squared errors is called the global minimum, whereas these points are called local minima. If we would, for example, initially guess the value of k to 0 0.02 and move down like this, then the function would estimate the value of k to 0 0.029. Similarly, if we would guess the initial value of k to 0 0.034, then the method would also estimate the value of k to 0 0.029, which means that we have found the global minimum and that the model fits best to the data. If we instead would initially guess the value of k to 0 0.036 or to 0 0.06, that would result in that the method would estimate the value of k to 0 0.04, which means that we are stuck on the local minimum and that the model does not fit well with the data. If we would guess the value of k to 0 0.07, the value of k would be estimated to 0 0.064, which would result in an even worse fit to the data. To find the global minimum, we therefore need to try many initial guesses, or come up with some initial guess that is relatively close to the global minimum, as we discussed in the basic video about nonlinear regression. This was the end of this video about the gradient descent method. In the next video, we'll see how Newton's method can also be used to find the minimum value of a function. Thanks for watching.